Hi everyone, Rick Russell here. Stand by for channel markers. Let's start with a sea story. A colleague of mine, a retired naval officer, tells the story of a good friend who had volunteered for the Marines when the Korean War started. He went to Korea as an artillery officer. He was an educated fellow, and one day his company commander says, Hey, we're sending you over to the Turks. Our hero says, Sure, but I don't know Turkish. And his CO says, Well, that's all right. They don't know English. But you know French, and they know French. His job was to call in American air support for Turkish infantry. And what he remembered most was that every request ended with, and please send the blue airplanes. They wanted the U.S. Navy's Corsairs and Sky Raiders. Turkish infantry quickly learned that U.S. naval aviators flying heavily armed aircraft with rugged, air-cooled radial engines had no qualms about flying low and dangerously close to support them. By 1950, the Corsair's reputation known as whistling death to the Japanese, was well established. That year, Jesse Brown and Thomas Hudner were flying Corsairs in close air support at Chosin Reservoir when Brown was shot down and Hudner received the Medal of Honor for trying to save him. Yet, in the difficult year of 1942, the F-4U-1 Corsair flunked its initial carrier landing trials. Nonetheless, the aircraft became not only one of the most successful fighter planes of World War II, but also one of only a few combat aircraft to fly in both World War II and Korea. It continued to fly operationally for foreign navies and air forces well into the 1970s. So what about that rocky start? Speed was king, as the plane's designer said, and the overriding performance goal. The Corsair story begins with the massive Pratt & Whitney XR2800 double WASP engine, which during testing in 1937 produced 1,850 horsepower. Started in 1938, Chance bought aircraft while working closely with the Navy to produce an initial design for a high-performance carrier aircraft labored to wrap the smallest possible airframe around the double WASP. At the time, German pilots were flying their fast all-metal monoplane fighter, the BF-109, in support of nationalist forces in the Spanish Civil War. The first British Supermarine Spitfire Squadron would be activated in August 1938. By contrast, the frontline fighter plane gracing the flight decks of the Navy's impressive Lexington and Yorktown-class aircraft carriers in 1938 was the stubby, outdated Grumman F-3F-2 biplane, and unfortunately, the Navy wasn't exactly thrilled by its designated successors either. The double WASP had the potential to produce more than 2,000 horsepower and tantalizing speeds of more than 400 miles per hour. Exploiting its great power, however, meant resolving a variety of difficult and conflicting requirements. In June 1938, Vought received the contract to proceed with the prototype, the XF4U-1. Reconciling those requirements produced the plane's unusual appearance. To convert high engine power to the thrust necessary to achieve maximum performance, for example, meant using a 13-foot, 4-inch, three-bladed propeller. That was huge by 1938 standards, and it led to the bent wing design. Bending the wings into a gull shape cleared the propeller and put the landing gear closer to the deck, allowing shorter struts, giving the plane its distinctive appearance. Installing the double WASP also required the addition of ducts and accessory equipment that, while necessarily preserving its lines, came at the expense of extending the fuselage, which led to its hose nose moniker. That in turn limited visibility, making landing and even taxiing difficult. Resolving one problem led to another, and so on. The designers solved the problem of incorporating slotted flaps in the curved gull wing section and, taking a tip from Vought's SB2U1 Vindicator developed a landing gear retraction mechanism that folded back and rotated 90 degrees, permitting the wheel to be housed flat within the wing. That reduced drag, as did streamlining the cockpit and canopy into the fuselage. It was always about speed. Powering the prototype XF4U1, the double WASP flew for the first time on 29 May 1940. By the end of the year, the aircraft had attained a speed of 404 miles per hour, 
faster than any contemporary American fighter plane. In June 1941, the Navy signed an initial production contract for 584 aircraft. Certain technical deficiencies and issues regarding flight safety could be addressed through pilot training, the Navy believed. Brewster and Goodyear were licensed to produce Corsairs too. At the same time, Grumman began work on its F-6F Hellcat. In December, with the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Navy's carriers went to war with Grumman's F-4F Wildcat. But in the first two carrier battles at Carl Sea in May 1942, and one month later at Midway, Naval aviators complained about the Wildcat's obvious deficiencies compared to the Japanese Navy's main fighter, the A-6M, later codenamed Zeke, but better known as the Zero. The Navy urgently needed Corsairs or Hellcats or both, but the XF-4U-1 performed poorly in simulated arrested landings. In June 1942, the same month as the Battle of Midway, the first production Corsair flew as did the Hellcat prototype, whose development was now coming along much faster. In September 1942, tests of the Corsair on board USS Sangamon were not encouraging. Lieutenant Commander Sam Porter made four terrifying landings and refused to try a fifth. The long nose prevented him from receiving timely feedback from the landing signal officer and making corrections during his approach. The plane's shock-absorbing strut sent the plane bounding down the deck as if on a pogo stick, sometimes missing the arresting wires, while the left wing tended to stall, that is, dip prematurely and unexpectedly right before touchdown. More adjustments followed, including adopting a new canopy starting with the 125th aircraft on the production line. But left wing stalls and other problems persisted. Wind tunnel and other tests suggested numerous fixes, from spoilers and ailerons with beveled edges to engine modifications and raising the pilot seat. By the end of 1942, after four of the war's five carrier battles had been fought with the Wildcat, the Navy had accepted 178 F-4U-1s, but none had deployed. Within a month, in January 1943, two Navy and one Marine squadron had been equipped with F-4U-1s, VF-12 at North Island, San Diego, VF-17 at Norfolk, and the Marines VMF-124 at Camp Kearney outside San Diego. Joe Clifton's VF-12 completed carrier qualifications on board USS Corps and were headed to Pearl Harbor when they received orders to swap their Corsairs for Hellcats. The squadron XO called the Corsair, quote, a beautiful bird. We estimated it had about 50 knots on the F-6F. By comparison, the Hellcat was a baby buggy, but we love the hog, unquote. By now, the delivery of Corsairs and Hellcats to operational squadrons was occurring roughly in parallel. So in its rush to get one new fighter into the Pacific War as soon as possible, the Navy shifted funding for support training and spares to the Hellcat because it was easier to handle. The Corsair was going ashore. The Marines, who were used to getting hand-me-down aircraft from the Navy, happily took the brand new Corsairs into combat first when VMF-124 arrived at Henderson Field on 12 February 1943, shortly after Guadalcanal was declared secure. They went into action immediately, supporting the advance up the Solomon's chain. VMF-124 made three deployments to the Southwest Pacific. They shot down 68 Japanese planes at a loss of 11 Corsairs in combat. The squadron produced three aces and one Medal of Honor recipient, Lieutenant Ken Walsh, who had 20 kills. Perhaps the most famous Marine squadron was VMF-214, the original Black Sheep, led by Gregory Pappy Boynton and popularized by a 1970s television series. Boynton would receive the Medal of Honor and survive captivity as a POW. Flying F-4U-1As, the original VMF-214 shot down 11 Japanese planes on its first day. It fought for 84 days, destroyed or damaged a record 203 planes, and produced nine aces, including Boynton, with 97 total confirmed air-to-air -air kills. The original black sheep were awarded the Presidential Unit Citation for Extraordinary Heroism in Action. VFN-75, a small night fighting squadron flying specially modified Corsairs, barely beat Tom Blackburn's VF-17, the original Jolly Rogers, as the first Navy squadron to take the Corsairs into action. 
BF-17, which was assigned to the new fleet carrier Bunker Hill, which had been commissioned on 25 May 1943 and was shaking down in the Atlantic, had no sooner completed carrier qualifications than it was given the option of swapping Corsairs for Hellcats. Blackburn recommended, quote, in the strongest possible terms that we go forward with the Corsairs. The F-4U is the better combat airplane, unquote. But the decision to simplify the training and spares problem by assigning all Corsairs to shore duty had already been made at a high level. As a result, BF-17 kept its Corsairs, but was ordered off of Bunker Hill and sent ashore in the Solomons, reaching New Georgia in October 1943, from where it destroyed 154 Japanese aircraft over Bougainville and Rabaul in 76 days. BF-17 also put the lie to the notion that Corsairs weren't suitable for carriers, when during one operation it split into two groups and made textbook perfect landings on Essex and Bunker Hill in November 1943. Meanwhile, in 1943, the British began flying Lend-Lease Corsairs from carriers. The Corsairs' first carrier combat operation didn't come until April 1944, almost four years after the prototype had first flown. When flying from HMS Victorious, Corsairs escorted ferry barracudas in an attack on battleship Tirpitz in Norway. In response to the kamikaze threat in December 1944, Marine Corps F-4U squadrons finally went on board the fast carriers as a way to increase the ship's defensive fighter strength quickly. The Corsair was on board carriers to stay. More than 11,500 Corsairs had been produced when the war ended in August 1945. During World War II, they shot down 2,140 enemy aircraft at the cost of 189 Corsairs in combat, which is better than an 11 to 1 ratio. Against Japanese fighters, Corsair pilots won at a rate of nearly 9 to 1, while Hellcats had a nearly 14 to 1 ratio against their much richer target pool of enemy fighters. Yet, for the entire war, the Corsair, in its shorter time on board carriers, delivered two and a half times the bomb tonnage as the Hellcat, foreshadowing the F-4U's utility as a fighter bomber. Once perfected across many variants, the aircraft more than lived up to its potential. Corsair production continued after the war, and well after production of its famous contemporaries had stopped. During the early post-war years, and until the arrival of jet aircraft in sufficient numbers, the Corsair anchored carrier fighter squadrons. When the Korean War erupted in June 1950, the only U.S. carrier in the Far East was Valley Forge. Her embarked air group was typical for the period. Two jet fighter squadrons with 30 F-9F 2B Panthers, two fighter squadrons, with 28 F-4U-4B Corsairs and an attack squadron with 14 AD-4 Sky Raiders. For Korea, carrier-based Navy F-4Us were soon complemented by Marine Corps Corsairs operating from smaller carriers. The Corsair had one of the longest production runs of any U.S. combat aircraft, continuing into 1953. It was the last piston-engine fighter built in the U.S. Production totaled 15,056 aircraft including some 2,500 that went directly to other countries. The Corsair flew operationally into the 1970s. The last U.S. Navy Corsairs assigned to a first-line squadron were F-4U 5N night fighters with Composite Squadron 4. They served until December 1955. Reserve Navy and Marine squadrons flew Corsairs until August 1957. The French Navy's F-4U-7 variant flew from 1953 to 1964. In 1956, during the Suez Crisis, Corsairs flying from two French carriers bombed Egyptian airfields around Cairo. In 1969, in the you-can't-make-this-up category, a lone Honduran Corsair shot down two Salvadoran Corsairs, as well as an F-51D Mustang during the soccer war between Honduras and El Salvador. In the 1990s, about 20 Corsairs were still flying. The number might be half of that today, but you can find beautifully preserved examples in museums all across the U.S., as well as in Argentina, Brazil, Honduras, and the Fleet Air Museum in the U.K. Finally, if you're interested in reading and seeing more, we highly recommend you obtain a copy of Naval Aviator Ernest M. Snowden's Naval History Special Edition on the F-4U Corsair. It's authoritative text 
an excellent collection of rare period photos, including many in color, tell the complete story of an aircraft that still enjoys near universal recognition and acclaim. That's all for this channel marker. Thanks for watching. Leave a comment or recommend another subject below. As always, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video.